Hi everybody, this is Stephen Pugh of the Home Bible College. This is our Q&A session, which we try to do every Saturday, God willing. Um, it's the 12th of March today, and we have two difficult questions, or relatively difficult questions. Often with the questions that are sent to us, we have um, re reoccurring themes and uh, we, we have two questions here that we may have talked in a similar way in the past but we'll we'll see how we go with it first question is i have an opportunity to manage a convenience store wouldn't there be a conflict if i was asked to sell pornography cigarettes alcohol and lottery tickets and that's all the question it asks now these are great questions um and i don't profess to know the answer to all these questions I can tell you what my personal opinion is and what I feel the Lord would lead me to do but of course um, that's quite a different matter um, thankfully we have some scriptural examples of matters of conscience the New Testament church struggled to re reconcile two points of view about eating food that had previously been dedicated to idols. Now there were some Christians that felt that to eat food that had been offered to idols in an idol temple, in a heathen temple, was to be participating in the idol worship system. But there were other Christians that felt that the food was just ordinary food and remained actually unchanged and they didn't feel that it was wrong to eat it at all. And this was especially true in some cities where all of the food that was butchered within the city had been offered to an idol prior to taking it to the meat market. Now Paul gives us the definitive answer to these questions in his letter to the Romans. He says that actually the food has not changed at all. It is still actually the same. The food remains completely unchanged. So Christians are allowed to eat it. However, he recognizes that as there are some people who would have a genuine bad conscience if they ate it, then he also takes that point of view into account. And especially people who became Christians having previously been idol worshippers they would have felt that they couldn't really have had any association in any way with the old heathen temples so we have at least three principles brought to us by the Apostle Paul the first principle is that every Christian must live according to their own conscience each Christian must decide between them alone and the Lord what they feel is the right thing to do. But the second principle is that there are people that are free, who feel free to eat um, the food that's offered to an idol. And um, if, if those who do feel free should not look down upon those people who don't you see they shouldn't look upon them as being uh, superior they shouldn't look down upon them as being weaker and the people who feel unable to participate are not to look down upon those who do thinking that they have denied their faith um, each of us is to have a heart of understanding and sympathy and compassion on how we view one another and principle number three is that there is um, another f another aspect to be borne in mind for example let's suppose the Apostle Paul feels himself free to eat meat that's been offered to an idol uh, he realizes that the food is completely ordinary food nothing has happened to it somebody's prayed over it but apart from that it's just ordinary food he says what if somebody whose conscience is more delicate than mine sees me eating food that's been offered to an idol and then they follow my example and they do something about which their conscience smites them and they then feel that they have 
forsaken the Lord, they've sinned against the Lord, when in actually they may not have sinned at all, but their conscience tells them that they have sinned. He said, because of that, I need to be very careful that I don't uh, display my freedom in such a way that those who copy me might lose the benefit of a clear conscience. You see, so there's these three aspects that everybody must constantly keep in mind. Um, one of the other things that, that, that's important here is that everybody has a limit to their personal responsibility. You see, am I responsible for every action of my husband or my wife? Or am I responsible for all the actions of my children or my family or my friends or my acquaintances or my workmates? Now, some people would say, oh, yes, of course you're responsible for what other people do. But there would be other Christians that say, well, not really. No, I, I'm responsible to God for what I do. And I cannot be held responsible for what other people do. This means, you see, that every single one of us has to come to our own judgment in, in a whole range of questions. Let me give you some examples. Am I responsible for what my neighbour does on a Sunday? Am I responsible for my children's actions when they're young? Am I responsible for my children's actions now that they're grown up or even married? Am I responsible for uh, the business ethics of the company that I work for? Am I responsible for my boss's private life? Am I responsible for the shopper who wants to buy things that are unsuitable for them? Am I responsible for a person that um, is offended by the things that I sell? Now to all of these questions there will be a whole range of solutions. And it's up to each one of us. As I say, first of all, the first thing is, it's up to each one of us to come to a judgment in our own minds as to what we feel God would have us to do. The second thing is, we have a responsibility to not look down upon those who have come to a different uh, point of conscience and assume that they've either sinned against the Lord or assume that they're stupid in some way. And thirdly, we must not act in such a way that by our actions we stumble those who see us act. Now, all of these things are going to help us. They're going to guide us in being able to uh, decide whether we should take a job in a shop that does uh, and sells these items so so there we are and, and these 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 conscience issues they're very real and they're very poignant i mean i'll give you another example of a difficult conscience issue there are some christians who are nurses or they work in hospitals and let's suppose a person works in a hospital where there may be an abortion a clinic the question we've got to ask ourselves is, can that nurse nurse somebody who wishes to have an abortion when that person may actually feel that having an abortion is something that's wrong in the sight of God? Or does the nurse say, well, actually, the moral choice is not mine. My job is to nurse the person. My job is to show the love of God and to give the very best care for people at their most vulnerable time. Or it could be that your conscience would say, I need to leave the job immediately. I cannot condone this. I cannot be part or party to an abortion. Now we can see that this is a, bif a difficult conscience thing. It's difficult enough 
it's difficult enough to decide in your own mind what would be the right thing to do but of course we have the added burden of other people are watching and they see what we do and our testimony can either be something that's good or something that's bad and as we learn from Martin Luther to go against conscience is neither right or safe so there we are and I expect we'll have lots more questions like that in the future they do pop up from time to time and we'll try to give our very best guidance from the scriptures on matters of this nature um, now <clears throat> another question that comes to us is what does it mean that we are not supposed to act in the flesh well there's a number of phrases in the scripture there's the phrase in the flesh or there's the word the flesh there is the phrase in the spirit or there is the word the spirit and these are found in lots of different verses let's take the word flesh first of all the word flesh or the flesh in scripture means at least three different things it can mean the human body or it can mean the human life or it can mean the the act of committing sins okay okay so um, the difference between these expressions sometimes is quite subtle however in the flesh can mean just the human body in 2 Corinthians 12 verse 7 he says lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations there was given to me a thorn in the flesh now in the flesh there it it means just his human body um, in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 3 he says for though we walk in the flesh we do not war after the flesh so there in that verse um, chapter 10 verse 3 rather we we see that walking in the flesh means to walk or to live a life a human life which may involve sin in some way in, in chapter 12 verse 7 he says lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of revelations there was given me a thorn in the flesh oh we mentioned that a moment ago let's look at another verse Galatians 2.20 Paul says I am crucified with Christ nevertheless I live yet not I but Christ liveth in me and the life which I now live in the flesh I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me so here again we have our life our human life of, of, of living in the human body um, sometimes the meaning of the, the phrase in the flesh can refer to a human being's life separate from God let's live in a little example for that at Romans chapter 7 verse 5 and when we were in the flesh the motions of sins which were, which were by the law did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death so this is an ordinary human life and this comes up in the numerous verses that I can think of in, in Philippians chapter 3 verse 4 he says though I might have confidence in the flesh so he's talking about his ordinary human life but it also can mean the acts of committing sins so for example in Galatians chapter 5 verse 16 Paul says this I say walk in the spirit and you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh so you can see there that with the addition of the word lusts we see that these are acts of the human life but they're sinful acts and there's lots of verses for that we'll give you another one in 2 Peter 2 verse 10 but chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lusts of uncleanness and despise governments presumptuous are they self-willed they are not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries so the phrase in the flesh then has these three separate meanings it refers to the body it can refer to our ordinary human lives but it can also refer to acts specific acts 
that are our sins uh, because they come from our low human nature now the phrase in the spirit this also can mean three different things it can refer to the spirit of a human being it can refer to the spiritual life in fellowship with God and it can refer to the in the experience of spiritual activity let me give you some examples of those the first one in Acts chapter 18 verse 5 and when Silas and Timothy were come from Macedonia Paul was pressed in the spirit Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. Now you'll notice the word is spirit with a little s, not a big s. This is his ordinary human spirit in which he was, um, he felt compelled in his ordinary human spirit being. We'll look at another example of that uh, in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 23 Paul says and be renewed in the spirit of your mind and again the word spirit there is a little s not a capital S he's referring to your ordinary human spirit the spirit of your mind but it can also mean spiritual life in fellowship with God so let's give a few examples of that Galatians chapter 3 verse 3 are you so foolish that having begun in the spirit capital S you are now made perfect by the flesh so this is not just referring to the human spirit this is referring to the spiritual life which is lived in the power of the Holy Spirit and in Ephesians chapter 6 verse 18 he says praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and it's capital S again so this isn't just the ordinary human spirit this is the Holy Spirit and then look let's look at the third one these are experiences of spiritual activity let's think of a few examples in that Galatians chapter 5 verse 25 Paul says if we live in the spirit capital S let us also walk in the spirit capital S so he's saying if we live in the divine enabling of the Holy Spirit then let us live our lives in the enabling power of the Holy Spirit let us walk in the spirit I'll give you another one in Revelation chapter 1 verse 10 that famous verse where John says I was in the spirit on the Lord's day now what this means is that he was having a Holy Spirit um, experience in which God the Holy Spirit was giving him into his mind visions of glory so this is the Holy Spirit and in Revelation chapter 4 verse 2 he says and immediately I was in the spirit and behold a throne was set in heaven so again he's having this special experience of God God the Holy Spirit and he is actively moved upon by the Holy Spirit in his life so the concept of being in the flesh and being in the spirit and Christians are not to live a life that's in the flesh we are we, we are human beings but in our human life we are to live a life that is dominated and led and controlled and empowered by the Holy Spirit and when we take a look at the seven deacons that were chosen in the beginning of the Acts just to serve tables just to make sure that the daily ministration of food for the widows was fair they were chosen for their spiritual qualities yes it was what we might consider to be a menial task but they needed the wisdom of the Lord they needed the leading of the Holy Spirit they needed divine enablement for them to fulfill this important duty and the first criteria that they looked for in those men was that they looked for men that were filled with the Holy Spirit now I'm hoping that this is some help to you 
Um, this is a new experience for me. I've not been doing these questions and answers for very long, so it's all very new. You'll have to forgive me if I slip up from time to time. And we're looking forward to more questions. Post your questions to us. Don't worry what they are. We don't have to say who the questions are from, but we do pray God's blessing upon you all. May God bless you. Have a wonderful day. Bye for now.